I'm reporting for FYI Diabetes. I'm here with Dr. Denise Faustman of the Faustman Lab. Dr. Faustman is in her phase two human clinical trials using the BCG vaccine to reverse type 1 diabetes. So Dr. Faustman, can you please tell us a little bit about the BCG vaccine and give our first time viewers a rundown on what you're doing in your phase two clinical trial? Sure. So uh, BCG is actually um, a 100 year, 120 year old vaccine that was originally developed for tuberculosis and as of today is still the most continuously used vaccine. But most people in the United States have never heard of it and they've never heard of it because um, in the U.S. you do not get multiple BCG vaccines for the prevention of tuberculosis. But um, over a 20 year research period we realized that BCG had um, significant clinical benefit potentially for people with existing type 1 diabetes. So that's why we're doing trials with this uh, cheap generic vaccine okay. called BCG. So how far along are you with your phase two clinical trials? Tri yeah, so when you do clinical trials, you go through different phases. Mm -hmm. Phase one was completed um, almost six years ago. Uh, we worked on um, uh, getting uh, the funding for phase two, and now phase two is fully enrolled and will last another five years. It's uh, based on diabetes standards, a large trial, it's 150 people, and um, it's randomized and double-blinded, so two, for every two people who get the vaccine, one's a placebo. Uh, but because of our um, dedication to try to find things that help people with type 1 diabetes, uh, if we get to the end of the trial in five years and you end up being the placebo, and the data looks good, we'll then dose the placebos. So we'll try to get back even at the end if you just happen to be the placebo. So why is this trial different from what's been done in the past? What is unique about this clinical trial? Yeah, that's a good question. So one is uh, BCG's a 100-year-old drug. It's uh, heralded as the safest vaccine in the history of the world. So we're w working with a known drug, a known vaccine, that has impeccable safety. So we're not working with a new drug where you don't really know what's gonna happen in five years with respect to safety. And also the BCG vaccine is traditionally given to all newborns on the globe, except for people in North America and Europe. So um, it's even been used in children. So that's a really good thing uh, for knowing safety in children, which is often hard to get. So that's number one, old fashioned vaccine. It's a cheap vaccine. Uh, the whole goal of this is um, making changes in diabetes healthcare so that it's affordable to the public. Third unique thing is these are some of the first trials um, or immune intervention trials to type 1 diabetes in people who have type 1 diabetes. That sounds like a no-brainer, but up until now it's thought that most immune interventions would not be strong enough for people uh, that have existing disease and they could only be used in new onset. So uh, we're not recruiting just new onset mm -hmm. diabetics, we're recruiting people that are 10, 15, 20 years out with diabetes. So that really changes the dynamics mm -hmm. of uh, the patient subset that we're aiming for to possibly help. So in past interviews, you stated that the BCG vaccine works at the most basic DNA level to normalize the abnormal immune response type 1 diabetics experience. Mm -hmm. To help us better understand, can you please explain how the BCG vaccine works to restore normality permanently? Okay, so uh, that's a you know long question, at least an hour. No, <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. So um, you have to remember where BCG came from. And so I call this kind of my California talk. So BCG was discovered at the turn of the century um, when it was noticed in Europe, when there was whole communities that died from tuberculosis, it was called consumption. And when people died from tuberculosis, they noticed that there was one subset of the population that didn't die. And it was these young girls. And then they also realized it was not only these young girls who didn't die of tuberculosis, but they were all milkmaids. And people put the pieces together that they were being exposed on their excoriated hands with some sort of bacteria that was in the dirt or, on, or growing on the udder of cows. And that's how this high-tech drug was developed. So it turns out it's not tuberculosis, but it's kind of tuberculosis of a cow, and it's a form of mycobacteria that's normally found in the soil. So we're using something that's the most low-tech bug you could ever imagine. But what's fascinating about it is that when you start mapping this old bug, that 
uh, was associated with the dirt and the farm animals, it maps all the way back to Neanderthals. So the bone marrow of Neanderthals was infected with mycobacteria. So how we kind of view this is putting back in a co-evolutionary bug that we've taken out the last 40 years. Because the last 40 years, your drinking water no longer has mycobacteria. I don't know about you, but I wasn't farming this morning. Okay. Um, I don't know about you, but I wasn't milking cows. And I don't know about you, but every time I get sick, I get antibiotics. So effectively, we're adding back in a kind of a co-evolutionary bug that's been taken out of the last 40 years, perhaps explaining why the incidence of type 1 diabetes and autoimmunity is on the rise and allergies globally. So you'll see that it's not just us doing trials in type 1 diabetes, but now you see people doing uh, 16 different global trials using BCG for reversal or prevention of allergies, for treatment of diverse autoimmune diseases, including multiple sclerosis, all based on somewhat the same premise, that this was an organism that you were exposed to all the time that helped mold your immune response genes. You take it out and you get this autoimmunity or these allergies. So we're just adding back in an old bug. So we're putting everybody back to being a milk baby. <laughs> okay, so what about long-term diabetics that may already have complications such as neuropathy, kidney yeah. disease? Will those diabetics still be able to receive the vaccine? Yeah. So in the current phase two trial, we had very set criteria. They were adults. They had a little bit of pancreas function measured with C-peptide. And they had no complications, okay? But as we move forward over the next year or so, funding permitting, we're going to take a broader selection of type 1 diabetics. Big demand to take people that are kids, right? Um, we call them the mad moms who call us all the time of like, why aren't you doing my kid if, if it's safe? And also, we'll want to do people with more long-standing diabetes who still don't have measurable CPAP type. So the whole idea is to, once we prove efficacy in a very select subpopulation of people at a given stage of long-term diabetes go to the opposite extremes of new onset and long-term diabetes. Improve, whether it works or not. So we love Boston and we love coming here yeah. from Georgia, um, but does every patient receiving the BCG vaccine have to travel here to Boston or can any participating doctor administer the vaccine under your direction? Yeah, so currently the only sourcing for uh, BCG of this strain is right here in Boston. Uh, the drug is rather unusual. So unlike a flu vaccine where people visualize a flu vaccine you need every year or a tetanus vaccine every five years, we think the dosing of this vaccine is really limited. So in the current, uh, the phase one trial, people only got two vaccines that are now followed for 10 years, okay? For this current trial in phase two, they get two vaccines and come back every year. So right now with FDA regulations, it's only in Boston, but as we move forward, we'll see. Um, traveling to Boston twice in your lifespan might not be too bad. Okay. Okay. We love Boston. <laughs> yeah. yeah, note that this interview is being done uh, before December here in Boston. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's very cold. <laughs> um, speaking of the FDA, mm -hmm. are they still on board with fast tracking the vaccine once the trials are complete? Yeah, so the word fast track is, uh, there's all sorts of status you can get in drug development, fast track, you know, breakthrough, et cetera. And um, the advantage of working with BCG is it's a 100-year-old drug. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm humbled by people who actually develop new drugs because when you're de developing a 100-year-old drug, guess what? You can go back to the literature and answer 50 questions on what's the safety of this drug. So we have advantages as we move forward because safety is very well known, very well established. Four billion doses have been given globally the last 100 years. And just wow. to give you a little perspective, last year 100 million newborns were vaccinated. 100 million. So when you start thinking about a drug that's used that ubiquitously mm -hmm. um, and still has impeccable safety, um, you got that box nailed. Now we have to nail the box uh, for drug approval, which is efficacy. So that's what we're working on now. So I know the current clinical trial is for type 1 diabetics. What about type 2 diabetics? Okay. Uh, yeah, so that's a good question. So um, 10 years ago, I would have said no hope for type 2. Okay, it's just, it's just a different disease, a high blood sugar, different disease. But we're gradually, as we learn more about BCG, 
thinking about whether type 2 diabetics could be helped. It's very early. We don't mm -hmm. know. Certainly we're not writing INDs to go into clinical trials, mm -hmm. but it's a consideration now. And what about, many of our viewers suffer from fibromyalgia. Mm -hmm. What about the BCG vaccine and fibromyalgia? Yeah, so um, the trials going on for all autoimmune disease, so fibromyalgia mm -hmm. is another example of another autoimmune disease. Um, we like to think there's probably efficacy for a broad range of autoimmune diseases. Fibromyalgia is one example. Mm -hmm. And uh, we recently obtained funding to start a phase two trial in fibromyalgia. So that'll probably get off in the next year or so. Oh, wow. um, all these trials are money dependent and sad mm -hmm. to say. Um, so if somebody comes through with their favorite disease and uh, funding, we're off and running. <laughs> and we have many parents with children who have cystic fibrosis. Oh, uh, yeah. Since this is an inherited disease, is there mm -hmm. any hope that the BCG vaccine will help them? That's a pretty fascinating question. So um, there could be. Um, the hard thing about doing cystic fibrosis trials, okay, so they have high blood sugar because their pancreas is fibrotic, okay, same thing that makes their lungs fibrotic, right? Um, but when people have advanced cystic fibrosis, they have decreased resistance to infections. And the BCG is a live attenuated infection. Um, very safe for anybody who's not immunosuppressed, but if you're immunosuppressed, not quite as safe. So if we ever designed trials in cystic fibrosis, we'd have to really work with uh, their physicians to figure mm -hmm. out when in their disease process they're not too immunosuppressed because they're on so many antibiotics, they get antibiotic resistant, so it would still remain safe. Okay, one last question. For many years, the medical community was adamant that a, a type 1 diabetic's pancreas was dead mm -hmm. and would never produce insulin mm -hmm. again. Yeah. You have refused to accept this as true, and you've given hope to millions of people. What keeps you motivated? What keeps you going? You know, that's a, that's a good question. Ask me around 6 o'clock in the morning. Coffee is a really good stimulant. <laughs> <laughs> but there's probably other reasons. You know, it, it seemed 25 years ago that it was a pretty slam dunk how to cure this disease, right? My career started out putting eyelids in, and we learned kind of a, an important and bad lesson 25 years ago. You take somebody, not that you have diabetes, but you take somebody that's 20 years of diabetes and you put new eyelids in and it's like putting wood on a fire, they eat them up right again. Mm -hmm. So it was that realization that pushed us back into studying the white blood cells, the bad white blood cells in this disease. And so with all that data, we realized that there was a way to kill those bad white blood cells and increase the number of good white blood cells. And so that's really the theory of the BCG vaccine. Um, and what drives us is um, um, knowing our data, knowing the strength of our data, and realizing that it's actually something you can translate. Because you can have the best idea, best theory, but if there's no way to create a drug, I mean, cystic fibrosis is a great idea, you know the gene, but if they make cured cystic fibrosis, it doesn't really help, right? You can get the gene to the right place. And so um, in this case, we think that something very affordable is able to get out there to change healthcare costs in people's lives. So that's why we push. Wow, it's very inspiring. Well, thank you, thank uh, you. <laughs> I know I said one last question, but I have one more. Okay. Do you still need funding for your clinical trials? Oh, trial? yes, yes. So um, these trials, you should know, so anybody watching this, these are totally philanthropically supported, okay? There's no industrial support here. And uh, we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the generosity of the American public. It's truly remarkable. It's not like, uh, I wish Warren Buffett would come through the door, but he hasn't. But it's not like a Warren Buffett coming through the door and saying, here's 25 million for your trial go. It's really, every weekend, like you're doing, events that go on. You know, whether it's golfing or hockey practice in Minnesota, or an event next weekend in Detroit, or uh, I have even had to go to a lot of golf events and I don't even golf, okay? So it's the public saying, you know what, this work is really unique, I want to be on board, and because of the safety and the selection of the patient population, people donate. Uh, people with not a lot of resources donate. So uh, it's really kind of symbolic of the generosity of the American public. Dr. Faustman, thank you so much for your efforts. I, along with millions of people around the world, greatly appreciate everything that you continue to do. If you would like to support Dr. Faustman in her efforts, 
you can follow the link below to donate and you can also visit your local Food Depot store starting November 20th through the end of this year and make a donation at the register. 100% um, of the proceeds will go directly to the Faustman Lab to support Dr. Faustman. Thank you.